So in the introductory remarks, I, I um, said the obvious and in, in, um, how important and how lucky a bioinformatics institute uh, uh, is to have Michael Waterman come give a talk. I don't think I probably need to introduce him very much, so I'm not going to go down the very, very long list of um, acknowledgments that the world has made. I'll simply say that by any estimation, um, in the area that this institute uh, lives in, um, he's one of the most important people alive. And, um, and he's here today, and I think it'll be a really interesting thing to um, hear what he has to say about the now and, the, and the, what he sees, I guess, as the future um, of this kind of work. Um, we're also very, very privileged to have um, him as a collaborator with Christian and this other group, and I think that we'll have in, maybe not in his daily physical presence, but in his interaction, um, the privilege of his presence for some time. Um, in any case, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Waterman. Ah, thanks for that uh, kind introduction and for including me in this uh, conference. It reminds me a bit of, uh, I know a number of you came from Los Alamos, and it reminds me a bit of the atmosphere at Los Alamos. My first summer at the lab was in 1970, and I was sitting in an office by a chemist. And, uh, you know, it was just a given at the lab that a chemist would be able to talk to a mathematician who'd done work in a just done a thesis in ergodic theory and be able and be able to make sense to one another, and I I, I really like that atmosphere. It's very uh, very productive. Let's see. So this is a very cheeky title, as you've probably seen in the 21st century. And really, it should be in the first 15 percent of the 21st century, and I'll spend most of my time in the 20th century, and um, make a small a tiny prediction about what comes next. So forgive me for not living up to the title. Um, so I'll, I'll, in that line, I'll talk about uh, how we pieced uh, DNA data together to read, to read the sequences uh, until the end of the Human Genome Project, then a little bit about next generation sequencing, and mostly this, is, this talk is about what happened to the methods that it worked up until 2001 when we got uh, absolutely deluge in data. So three, uh, three aspects of that is that a, com a completely different way of doing sequence assembly numer uh, from the computational side showed up. Uh, that uh, created very quickly uh, problems with requiring a huge amount of storage. This uh, incredible onslaught of data makes it much harder to predict or hard to predict properly uh, what the uh, genome coverage from a sequencing project is going to be. And then finally, how do we do just sequence uh, comparison with these huge data sets? So I'll ramble around those topics. Not too many formulas, I hope. You know, the great thing about a mathematician giving a talk to biologists is that you can say simple things and you don't get stoned to death. Um, <laughs> If you, go, if you go to a math talk and the speaker has, has said something about the fundamental theorem of calculus, half the mathematician will go out and say, acted as if we didn't know. And, you know, no biology ever stomped out and said he acted as if he didn't know A paired with T or there was a double helix. So it's, it's, really, it's, a, it's a nice environment to, to be in. Um, let's see. I don't, yeah, so actually I want to stick with that for a moment. Uh, I, I don't have this slide, but um, this reminds me, uh, and you know that, that slide when uh, Watson and Crick had, the, had discovered the double helix, and they're in the lab in Cambridge, and there's that physical model, and Watson is standing down from it with that dopey look on his face, <laughs> and Crick is standing up, pointing this way, pointing at, at the... At the structure, and he's maybe kind of, if you look at it, it's maybe kind of ironic he's about to laugh. The, uh, and I never noticing it, uh, 
at least a thousand times before that Crick is holding a slide rule to point <laughs> at the base pairs, and it's because the, uh, the reporter asked him to do that. And I think it's really symbolic. Mo many people here really never heard of a slide rule today, but we used to use them. And uh, I think it's just a hint of how rapidly the progress is made. So again, now I say the, the obvious thing. Uh, double helix, complementary base pairs, A pairs of T, and so on. And um, we've got uh, a lot of DNA molecule in, uh, jammed into a, into a single cell. So packaging, I'm going to talk about that's a big thing now. So I want to go to say something about the, does somebody have a pointer? Maybe this is it? Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, so I want to say something about how we used to sequence DNA. It's, 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 it's different, it's not different now. So this is the unknown piece of DNA with a, a known uh, a sequence here. So you get a, a, a primer that you've labeled, and then um, the, the Sanger method uh, was basically to have f uh, four different reactions, and in this reaction, the, um, the uh, A's, a uh, fraction of the A's are chain terminating. So the polymerase adds bases until it comes to something where it's putting an uh, A opposite a T, uh, and for the fraction of uh, those incorporations that are chain terminating, uh, you get a, a short uh, double helix ending at that position. And the other places where you're incorporating uh, uh, A's, they'll stop too. So you have a population of uh, molecules, uh, double-stranded molecules, that are ending at, the, at a specific letter. Uh, these came out on uh, gels uh, with purposes, one for each, each letter, and uh, it didn't used to look this way. I remember in the early 1980s, my friend uh, had two uh, sheets of glass, literal sheets of glass, held together with big paper clips, wire, and, and of course they poured the, the, the gel, the acrylamide, uh, down between the sheets of glass. There were tangles of wire going off because it's electric charge, DNA overall is a negative charge, that pulls these pieces across. Um, and the longer pieces don't, don't fall as fast as the shorter pieces because they can work their way through. Uh, but not only did it look pretty Rube Goldberg-like, but these, these, these guys did, don't behave very, very well. They would be in, in arcs. It was hard to tell the A column from the T column is what I'm trying to say. So the image, the figure, uh, get, getting this out to, uh, to reading sequence where you have to know that those, those, those two letters are before this letter and so on. After I should have said, but that's all right. So um, as things speeded up, there were uh, automatic sequencing machines that were developed at uh, beginning at Caltech where uh, the labels on the, the pieces became uh, fluorescent dyes, uh, one color for each of the terminating bases. And having four different fluorescent dyes, you could run these things in one column. So they, don't, they aren't crossed up. They're still crossed up, but it's not so bad. Uh, and you'd save uh, uh, set, uh, the, uh, on, on materials, greatly on materials cost. Um, and these became very, very uh, skinny tubes to uh, save even more money. So we sort of switched uh, to detection of bases becoming image processing, and again, this happened to make the, all these people, Lee Hood, Lloyd Smith, and both the Hunkapilla brothers, uh, rich. And so this is the image, the image processing. There's, uh, like Christian, I'm a little bit color challenged. Uh, so there are supposed to be four colors there, and uh, the, uh, these are, are, are measuring the, uh, the fluorescent dyes. So you can kind of see if there's... Um, um, Runs of the same base. Sometimes you get you can be off by a base, and that's a that's a whole whole business of uh, deconvolving these into sequence. So uh, just to say something about modern sequencing history, when we the Human Genome uh, Project uh, got kicked off, I think in 1995, 
And it wasn't until that year that the first uh, complete DNA sequence of a free-living organism was determined. So it was very cheeky to, to think about the human genome then. Uh, so that was, in 1995, two million base pairs, bacterium. In 1996, uh, yeast, 12 million base pairs. In 98, uh, Solera practiced their uh, whole genome sequencing by sequencing uh, Drosophila first, 100 million base pairs, and then, um, or I get, I'm sorry, I skipped it. I missed the elegans there, 100. And uh, the, uh, Dros uh, Sol Solera did Drosophila, it was 140 million base pairs. So things really moved rapidly. So what was, what was the assembly process? And you, as most, most of you probably know, you get these sequencing reads that are randomly located on the text that you're trying to infer. Uh, and um, you determine the underlying text by finding, and you don't know where these guys are. So uh, at least in the whole genome sequencing version of the problem. So you're trying to find reads that are overlap very well, and you're trying to tile the genome by oh, these overlapped reads. This is a restatement here, but the reads are, um, say, from 50 to a few hundred letters long, depending on the technology. They're randomly located. They're not all correct. The, the uh, one letter substitute for another one happens uh, more frequently than insertions and deletions, but all things happen. And you don't know which strand of DNA you're reading. So you've got, for every possible read, you've got um, two ways of orienting against everything else. So if there were a thousand reads, you have two to the thousandth possible configurations against one another. Uh, repeats, which was uh, mentioned today, repeats are maddening in this. Uh, over half of our, 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 our own genome is repeats. There are uh, over a million ALU repeats, so we are 10% ALU repeats. And I think, um, my advisor had some crack like uh, any freshman knows that uh, college professors repeat themselves. Uh, uh, the 90% of what they say is just repetition. That's why students don't listen. Uh, at any rate, but when you're doing sequence assembly, you try to, uh, with this overlap idea, you're trying to overlap uh, things that are close together, so these repeats might get jammed together in a, in a large island, and you incorrectly assemble the genome like this when it should be a, a, the, the top configuration. So here's, here's Sanger, uh, who invented dideoxy sequencing, was not a fan of computation at all, but uh, on inventing this technology, he asked around for somebody to write a program. The first person he asked was Michael Levitt, who just got, not this year, but the year before, a Nobel Prize, but not for this, and Michael passed on, on that. Uh, a guy named Roger Staden wrote the first program, and it was a very simple-minded version of what was still done through the end of the Human Genome Project, although that was much more sophisticated. Still, it's like cars today are more sophisticated versions of the Model T. They still run about the same way in principle. So here, we'll just zip through this. Uh, so for, for every pair of reads, we'll decide are they overlapping, do they have significant overlap or not? And, if you, and after you've answered that question for all pairs of reads, are there groups of them that are consistently overlapping so that you might uh, believe that a text would appear below them? And once you have all this, you actually have to do the multiple alignment and make that text appear. So this is a hard problem, and both these others are harder, genuinely harder. There's our sequence there out, out behind, the, behind the table, I guess. So let's just I'll take as a a simple um, uh, example of how the, how the computation was just at the limits of our abilities. Um, let's take this, this overlap computation. And if you want to do this rigorously, um, the, uh, the overlap, you, you can perform uh, one of these, the best overlap calculation, 
with something that, that looks at every pair of letters. So you have to do length of this sequence times length of that sequence. Now that's, people shortcut that for reasons you'll soon see, but that, that sort of is my straw horse here to talk about. The human genome example, Celera genomics, uh, assembled a, a computer system to, um, to uh, do their sequencing of the human genome that was at that time the largest computer system outside of a, of a military uh, base, the largest system on earth they put together to do this. It, it, was, it was absolutely awesome. Um, so let's take their 27 million reads of length 550. There are uh, over 10 to the 14th pairs of reads, and if I was going to do this uh, principle comparison, each, each pair would take 550 squared, so we would get total resources uh, exceeding 10 to the 20th times something, which is just too much. So you, you know they were smarter than that, but it's a serious computational problem. Uh, and this, this picture is just to remind me to tell a story that I, I visited Solera several times in Rockville, Maryland, a couple of buildings they put up to sequence the human genome. There were two huge rooms that were supposed to be full of people and sequencing machines. And when I got there, uh, this was alongside one of the rooms. There may have been two of these machines, and that was it. In this big, quiet room, and the sequencing was going on. The, these new ABI sequencers had absolutely uh, made the, the, uh, the time and space requirements uh, obsolete. And I thought this was the most modern thing. It was the most modern thing I'd ever seen. I felt like I was far in the future, and wow. And today, it, it, it looks like the Model T to me. Of course, the rest of you, hard to believe anybody could have been so naive. But there you are. So anyway, uh, so assembling just the, just the genome sequence from the reads is really a challenging problem. Uh, the computer programs used through the Human Genome Project were upgrades of Roger Staden's approach. And these were smart people really working hard. And then along comes next generation sequencing right after the end of the Human Genome Project. And this slide is just, this is cost of sequencing, and that's capacity of machine. That's all I want to show you. Some of these, forgotten when this was out a long time ago, so some of these companies are gone now. But uh, Illumina mentioned several times today, is a popular platform and dominating the, the world market. And there's a, a lovely story where you take the double-stranded DNA you want to sequence, you get adapters, these little guys where the polymerase can start, uh, except here it's for something else. These adapters uh, stuck on the end, make it single-stranded, and get it to um, stick to a, a surface which uh, has the complements of these adapters. So you get a piece of DNA stuck. So, so this is a guy we'd like to sequence. He's stuck right there. And then through very clever manipulations, that single-stranded locally gets, gets duplicated over and over again. So there's a patch uh, of, of um, hair standing on this chip, all of which is the same DNA sequence. And the sequencing happens uh, step by step. I'm going to do it. Let me show you the answer. You don't want to go through this. Uh, so here's the polymerase uh, working its way up the unknown strand of DNA. And at each stage, a uh, picture is taken, and whatever the yellow, uh, and of course, all these spots are from sequences that we don't know, and we don't know what they are or where they are, except the image processing will say, well, there's one there, and at this stage, it's the yellow base. And that's how the, uh, the sequencing gets, uh, gets done. So, so we went from, in 1985, holding a couple glass sheets together with paper clips to to doing millions of those operations on a, on a chip, uh, you know, 20, 25 years later, uh, incredibly parallelized uh, the original operation. This slide was shown earlier, and I, I, every talk I give, I show this slide. It's, it's the slide to look at, in my opinion. Uh, this, you know, so this is the cost of a, not an assemble, but a raw megabase of DNA sequence. And this is around 2001 to 2012. 
And so, so um, cost is, if it were Moore's law, it would be going down um, by, by half every, every year. This would be the Moore's law, which is you know, obviously really good. And as is pointed out, we, we fairly quickly started beating Moore's law and then the Illumina platform. And I think you can blame, perhaps blame this leveling off down here uh, to Illumina dominating the market. But still, in 11 years, whatever this is, gone from $8,000 for a raw mega base to eight cents. And uh, I think I've said in talk once that was a factor of a million, it's only 100,000. <laughs> and there's a, so my only prediction for the next um, 85 years after the first 15 is that there's at least a factor of 10 sitting there. So this is gonna be re really cheap. There'll be secomatics that will be in doctor's offices, I, I'm guessing. So uh, doing, uh, trying to do sequence assembly with our old methods really, uh, really created a, an incredible mess. So uh, some new idea was needed, and uh, this idea uh, goes back to uh, Euler in the, uh, in the uh, 19th century, so I'm really, I'm really getting away from the 21st century. But um, the idea of this, of this new, new technique was to take each of the reads and take the first 25 letters that's a K word. Take the next, take, just move over one, take the next 25 letters. So take all 25 letter uh, words in this read, and uh, you make a graph where those reads are the edges, and you merge all the identical reads are, mer are the same, and you look for what's called a Larian pass. And I hope I have some. No, I've shortened this down, I guess. So Larian path. Is a path that visits each edge once and only once. Larian circuit is one that gets you back where you, where you started. Uh, let me show you how this goes just to, uh, to uh, down. Now here's my sequence. And uh, there's uh, the K is three in this case. So that's, uh, that's our edge. So here's our first guy is ATG. And uh, it may look crazy because AT there and a T there, the ATG is the edge here, A, T, the T's are in common. Um, to begin with an A, you have the overlap T at the end of the G. So that's our first step. We're going to take everyone and do that with it. Uh, T, G, T. And keep going. So this is the graph we get. Um, and we're supposed to traverse this graph and come up with a sequence. And it looks like you have to be smart to do it, would appear. Looks like you have to just start here and know you go uphill and back down, and here uphill and back down. But you don't. That is, you don't have to be smart. So let's imagine we uh, decided that we would take this step first. So we started with AT, and this step will add the G to that. Uh, and here we've got, we've got Two ways we can go, we, we, we think we'd like to go uphill. Imagine we did the wrong thing and we went horizontally. So let's just remember there was something we didn't explore, but we added a C by doing it horizontally. We'll do the same thing again. Now what we do, uh, let's see which, which one I do first, yeah. So what we do is go back to one of these unexplored edges and then just go out. So first step, we get a C, add a C at that spot, then we add a G, and then we add a C. We're back here, there's no unexplored edges, so, oh, we go to the other place with an unexplored edge, pop those out, and we determine the sequence from this path. And notice, uh, at least in this graph, this was linear time. I didn't have to think, and I didn't have to do anything more than once. We did a Hamiltonian path, which is everybody's, everybody's instinct, uh, is that these, these three-letter guys, which I, of course I'm thinking of as reads, these three-letter guys would be the vertices of the graph, and this is the graph you would get from that, and, to, and this is a so-called Hamiltonian path problem that you're trying to visit all the vertices, and that's NP-hard, and you have to be smart to do that. In fact, you have to be more than smart. 
So, so the Alarian Path approach goes back to a paper by Ramana Ittery and myself in 1995, and um, no, no one noticed this paper. I mean, two or three people. <laughs> knew what they were doing. I think if Gene Myers hadn't gone to Solera, I think those guys would have used this, but Gene did, and he was, he was uh, an, an, an expert in assembly. So uh, at any rate, uh, this stuff just, it sort of sat there for a while, and Pavel Pevsner in the early 2000s uh, took it up, and um, I think I've just said that. Uh, and this is another sort of picture. So you have all these, all these words that are, you can see this is sort of working because these um, duplicate uh, K letters end up ideally just down in the linear structure. Of course, the genome doesn't ascend linear, but that's, that's the idea. The, the advantage of this approach is you can, you can cruise through and find uh, Alarian uh, paths within the complicated network in linear time. There's no pairwise alignment. Everything I spent my life doing before that, this throws away. There's no layout, there's no consensus. It, 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 it avoids all three of those steps, and indels are just as easy or hard as substitutions in normal alignment, so that's really a, a new step. Um, orientation is, uh, Ramana and I realized that our programs are running so fast that we just put in the reverse complement of everything. And you get, so, you, so, so you get the genome twice. It's, uh, you, and you don't have to worry about uh, the exponential number of orientations. That's a huge thing that Meyer spent, wrote papers about how to get things that were, that were consistent when you're, when you're doing assembly. The, the, the drawbacks of all this is you get edges that are incorrect, of course. You get a tangled graph, and the storage requirements were huge. And the, the erroneous edges uh, sometimes aren't, aren't so hard. If you've got an error here, probably the K words that have that error letter are probably unique. And, and so you get little bubbles. So you get, the, say, the main, uh, most of your reads are, are suggesting this. A little bubble to the side that has very light weights. And, you, and Ramon and I cut these off. And what... Um, uh, Hevsner did was change the letter so it was consistent and call it error correction. So uh, that's, and, and most, most of the programs now do that. Uh, the fancy version of this problem is you've got your whole, uh, remember these, these edges have to do with uh, the reads, um, but the, the, uh, the colored arrows here are, are long reads, so that's the I suppose that's blue, that's red, that's yellow. And what you'd like is find an Alarian path through here that broke these reads as few, as few times as possible. Um, so Ramon and I, um, we kept a list of the, so if we had a keyword, we had a list of every read that keyword appeared in and the position in that read. So I could reproduce the entire project just from the graph. And very quickly, uh, um, People uh, threw all that list away, and they took the complement, the reverse complement, and stored them together. Uh, they uh, represented the graph as a distributed hash table. They didn't. They stopped storing multiplicity of edges. And some people um, got his name. Does uh, finding a few words that summer that special special reads that su special words that summarize the reads. So you reduce the number of reads in the project. So people have really worked hard on storage, uh, storage reduction. Still an issue. Um, now I'd like to move to my topic two. So, so right there we saw this uh, modern technology, next generation sequencing, uh, destroy how we knew how to assemble genomes. Completely killed it. Now you have to do something completely different. So, Topic two, where the same thing will happen. Uh, genome coverage. When we were first doing genome projects, um, it was um, uh, people were doing overlaps of clones to try to map the, uh, the, the genome with clones, and that motivated Eric Lander and I for, for, uh, with a paper that we got used quite a bit in sequencing projects. And our, the input parameters were the number of reads of length L, 
the size of the genome. Uh, Eric and I added a fraction. You have the, the reads have to overlap by at least 20% or you can't detect it. And just that addition uh, gave us some formulas that, that let people track how well their sequencing projects were going. And uh, yeah, you do distribute. And, but what was at the heart of this assumption was that the reads were, really were randomly Poisson distributed across the genome. And we know that's true some of the times, but not true all the time. Uh, paired in reads were, made our formulas much harder to get. Uh, people have done other work that didn't impact the use of these formulas much. But um, today, we have next generation sequencing projects, uh, coverage of each, each base in there, and the average of 50 to 100 times is common. Uh, and our formulas are, assume uniform coverage, and they're really not useful anymore. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, the, the next generation of, uh, of um, analysis here was done by somebody down the hall from me, uh, Andrew Smith. So let me try to, try to tell you what was in his mind and how cool his work is. So we've got, we're, we've got the original DNA molecules in our, in our soup that we uh, are amplifying with polymerase chain reaction. So this orange guy gets amplified, whatever that is, purple maybe gets amplified. But in fact, um, the, um, the mapping of these guys, uh, we, j we sampled four from the orange and one from here. Uh, so there was a very, we're trying to say is at least in this incarnation, uh, these orange guys got much more of the action than this one. Let me try to make this more sensible. Uh, here's, here's, our, here's our genome that we've amplified uniformly and sampled from it. Here's a different genome that we've amplified that wasn't uniform. So when I reach in here and pull out a string, it's much more likely to be purple than something else, right? And that's going to bias my view of the size of the genome. If, you, if all of your reads came from the first million base pairs of the human genome, you'd think it was a pretty small place. So what can you do about this? I, the, my formulas with, with Eric were for this statistical setting, not this one. And um, Andrew points out, this, this is uh, um, three libraries, and the left hand, the, the horizontal uh, axis is the fraction of unique reads in the library. They've sequenced a million reads, and over the, this, this, this library, over 99% were unique. Down here, it was a little over 97%, and this one almost 98%. So if you had to pick between the two rightmost, you would surely pick the red one to go ahead on. But if you went ahead and, se and sequenced 50 million reads, you would find the red guy was less than 60% uh, new, unique, showing you what's in the genome. Uh, the um, purple or whatever this is is almost 70%. So this was very misleading. How could you, how could you predict that later on you would be better off going with the with, with the one on the left. So um, there's something called capture recapture statistics, uh, started by uh, R.A. Fisher. I.J. Good uh, did some work in this. Lots of people worked in this. Uh, and relation between the number of species and the number of individuals in a random sample of an animal population. Um, so, it, so he says, you go here. If n additional butterflies are caught, how many new species would it be observed? And if it isn't quite a few, NSF is not going to fund this guy. <laughs> so there's so application of capture recapture, which is really famous. Uh, and some of you may have even heard of it. It's a problem that uh, Brad Efron and Ron Tisted at Stanford took up uh, in the in the 70s. How large was Shakespeare's vocabulary? And um, I think a uh, high school student who had to read Romeo and Juliet would just say. Look at, the, look at the plays and head them up. But uh, in, in, in his plays, so that's our, that's, our, that's our data, that's our sample. And in these plays, there are 14,376 words used once, 
4,343 used twice, and so on. And Ephron says Shakespeare knew at least 35,000 more words than that. How, how did they decide this? That's, that's coming next, and we'll, we'll do that. For, and for biology, we could uh, people uh, look at 16S RNA uh, to look at microbial species diversity. Uh, how many unseat genetic variants are there? Dot, dot, dot. It's important questions. And let's just, let me repeat the problem once more. Here's our data. We know how many times we uh, had uh, a, a, a unique read or index the reads by their first letter. That's, it's, if I'm confusing it. So there are 169,000 something uh, unique. Uh, there are N2 of them we saw twice and so forth. How many did we see, had, did we see zero times? And you can make up scenarios where, you, where this problem is completely unsolvable, but um, oh, I, can't, I didn't go on it. So at any rate, uh, so uh, the cool thing about this, is Andrew had to look at um, the work other people did. There's a method of moments that comes in here. Any statisticians? Um, and because of the pressure, this is a lot more data than counting up the words in Shakespeare when you're working with, um, with sequencing libraries. And he, he had to invent uh, new, new methods to analyze this data. And uh, it, was, it re it's re really turned out uh, cool. So there's example number two, where our old, our old fairly satisfactory method is just thrown out with the garbage now, and we move on. So uh, the last uh, topic where this, this is happening, and maybe in a little less dramatic way, uh, is sequence comparison. And people were using sequence comparison to discover evolutionary relationships from the days of the first sequences. Um, then the problem shifted to finding pieces of sequences that were closely related. Um, the young man in the center here with the, the other person here with a tie uh, has, has been in a class where he learned algorithms for doing this, right? Um, so, uh, so there, the, pr the problem changed, was solvable, and uh, algorithms and statistics are both important for these things. This is uh, talking about traditional alignment first. What are we doing and why are we doing it? We have alignments, we have scores for the deleted inserted letters, scores for the uh, mismatches, and we're looking over all possible alignments to find the best, uh, best scoring alignment. It's, and the formula would be you maximize over an exponential number of alignments of the alignment score. There's a quadratic time algorithm for that. And local alignment, a similar, similar thing. So my, my paper with Temple Smith is, is the one that uh, gives a, a, a quadratic algorithm for finding local alignment, the two pieces that match up the best. Uh, BLAST is an incredibly useful uh, heuristic for local alignment, and, and in fact applies our, our algorithm to sub-pieces of their matrix. So how do we speed this up? Is it can't, can't do that anymore. And um, the speed up involves uh, K words. Uh, K might be six, five, four, whatever your choice is. And you look at the number of K, of K words of each kind, four to the K, K words, it's DNA, and you look at each of the four to the KK words, look at the number of times it occurred in sequence A, multiply by the number of times it occurred in sequence B. Uh, that is clearly a linear time algorithm. Computer science isn't, isn't worth having a slide. We just have to count the K words and do this multiplication. It's not a very sensitive uh, score. And, um, <clears throat> What uh, we found when we started looking at this is that that, uh, that scalar product um, approaches a product of normals if the alphabet is uniformly distributed, and otherwise it approaches a sum of normals. The uniform distribution is the outlier here, and it's the only, it's the only way D2 is a very, very useful statistic. Otherwise, the sum of normals turned out to be uh, 
having to do with how well each sequence fit its possible k-word distribution. Very, very, very subtle thing, which I don't. Well, okay, I'm going to I'm going to show you a formula and sort of see what's happening. Um, now, statisticians, first of all, this this guy here, it's it's not. What every student learns in the first class in statistics, what? Subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, eh? So we haven't even subtracted the means here. So why don't we do that? So here we take the number of times W occurred in X and subtract its expectation. Uh, number of times it occurred in Y and subtract its expectation. So that's, this, so that's at least subtracting the means of these two things. Then if you expand the original D2, you get this centered guy, a couple of terms, and a constant. To see that the uniform distribution is special, if PW is a constant, 1 over 4 to the k, whatever, then this, this number is deterministic. And there's no variation in it. But if, there, if, if PW is not a con if it's different for different Ws, then this thing has statistical variation. And in fact, it's variation that dominates the centered version. Uh, so D2 has variance in cubed if the alphabet is not uniform. It has variance in squared if it is uniform. So something really different is happening. Um, there's a great character in probability named Larry Shep. He, he, passed away recently, but had a long and very uh, energetic career. And uh, I, I don't know if he was a faculty member in 1964, he was just a student, but he, he published this, uh, this uh, as a problem, which ended up in Feller Volume 2, so pretty cool. Um, so if x and y are mean zero normals, x times y divided by the, sum of the, by the square root of the sum of the squares, is also normal with a variance you could write out. So our way of taking what Larry did and converting it to our stuff is using the centered version and just uh, plugging those in there. So this is sort of a self-centered uh, comparison. Again, still linear, linear time, still. Uh, there's another version that we, we like a lot too where we can uh, this is an approximation for the product of the standard deviations. So at any rate, um, what I wanted just to say is that, uh, as I said at the beginning of this, uh, we, we really have big data, whatever, whatever it is you want to call it, from next generation sequencing, and it has just completely changed uh, techniques that were used uh, until uh, the 21st century. Um, and this is going to keep happening. If we are getting reads that are 50,000 base pairs long, it's going to be something different. Um, and for you know, I, I'm confident. My only prediction, as I say, for the next 85 years is that the, is that there's a lot of improvement uh, le left left in this uh, in in in, uh, in sequencing. Sequencing just it's becoming a, a wonderful commodity now, and. Uh, I think we've seen that happen in, se in several of the talks today. So um, I think it's late enough in the day. I'm going to shut up. Thank you. <laughs> and if there are any questions, shoot, shoot. Usually I can't answer them, so. So I'm curious if you're uh, familiar with this So a, I'm I'm certainly all all in favor of it, and in fact, one one of one nice thing about this this Alarian thing is it's a, it's a great data structure as well, but um, um, so I I like that a lot. Uh, one of the caveats, I guess, um, is if you're going to compare um, two graphs, sort of genome graphs like that, it's, uh, it's, it's computationally a harder thing. But if you've represented every, every, everything you've sequenced up to now in a graph, then a, then a new sequence can go on that without much trouble. Um, 
but uh, it won't make things any simpler, but I think it's extremely important. I mean, thinking, you know, when, when we started, we said the human genome as if there was one and we were going to sequence it. And, I mean, no one, no one was that naive, but we, you have to start somewhere.